Welcome to Hard on Talken. My name is Dirk Schieborn and in this video I want to talk to you about so-called Taylor approximations. The Taylor approximation is one of the most important concepts in mathematical analysis. And it is all about approximating functions. Functions which are complicated and hard to calculate. And we want to approximate them with functions which are simple to calculate and easy to understand, in this case polynomials. So I wish you lots of fun and let's go! I want to start this video by showing you a little animation. Here the blue function is the well-known sine function and that orange function is one of the simplest polynomials we can think of, namely f of x equals x. This orange curve is also a polynomial which is still simple, although not as simple as a straight line. It is a polynomial of third degree. What is striking is that this polynomial behaves very similar to the sine function in an area around zero. Now this orange function is a polynomial of fifth degree and the area where it is very close to the sine function has grown bigger. And as the animation showed, there is an entire sequence of polynomial functions which approximate the sine function better and better. Now this is the exponential function, f of x equals e to the power of x. This is the constant function y equals 1, a very simple, in fact a constant, polynomial. It is obvious that it doesn't behave very much like the exponential function. The only thing is that they have the same function value at 0, namely 1. This is a polynomial of first degree, a straight line. Although it doesn't look like the exponential function at all, near 0 it looks much more similar to the exponential function as the horizontal line did. In a way, it is a better approximation for the exponential function near zero than the horizontal line. Note that the exponential function and that orange straight line not only have their function values at zero in common, but also their first derivatives, that means their tangent lines. In fact, the orange line is the tangent line to f at zero. Now this is a polynomial of second degree. Obviously it is a parabola which is situated in a way that it crosses the y-axis at the point 0, 1. And it also looks like that the parabola and the exponential function have a common tangent at 0. And in fact there is something more which they have in common which is not immediately obvious. And that something is the second derivative at 0. It's just as if the way these two functions touch each other gets closer and closer. This polynomial is of third degree and, as you might already guess, it has the function value, the first derivative, the second derivative and the third derivative at zero in common with the exponential function f. And we can continue this game with a sequence of polynomials of higher and higher degree. This principle of how we can approximate a given function by a sequence of polynomials with higher and higher degree is the topic of this video. In fact, that principle is one of the most important results in mathematical analysis and is called the Taylor approximation. Before we dive into the theory, let me show you how beautifully simple the formulas of this sequence of polynomials look like in this special case. The first function of the sequence, the function of constant value 1, has this formula. Admittedly, this is one of the weirdest ways we can write down the number 1. But I promise you that is the starting point of a very satisfying principle, so let's tolerate this at that moment. The next polynomial, the straight line, has this formula. In fact, this expression simply equals 1 plus x. And again, it's a weird way to write down 1 plus x. 
The next polynomial in the sequence, the polynomial of second degree, has this formula. This expression actually equals the quadratic expression x squared over 2 plus x plus 1. And even though this is still not the simplest way to write that down, the underlying principle of this formula starts to reveal itself. Let's have a look at the next polynomial in the sequence, the polynomial of third degree. Now the principle of how the formula evolves is clear and we can continue the animation, now not only animating the curves but also animating the formula. Let's stop here at the 21st summoned, although I think it's quite clear that we can continue this principle forever and ever. It is an interesting question if in the limit we will precisely obtain the exponential function. Indeed, this is the case. Now there are a couple of questions. What happens here? What is the theory behind this amazing approximating principle? And can we apply it to every function? That means, can we approximate any given function by a sequence of polynomials like this? In order to spoil a little bit, the answer to the last question is yes, as long as the function behaves nicely enough, that means as long as it is differentiable up to a sufficiently high degree. So let us now start at the beginning of the story. Suppose you are given a function, like here the exponential function. Suppose further someone asks you to choose a value along the x-axis, let's say 0, and to construct the best linear approximating function to the given function f at this value. What would you do? Well, you probably would start with drawing some straight line through the point where f intersects with the y-axis. That straight line could look like this. In the next moment, you might be not so happy about the way how that straight line approximates the function f around zero. And you might want to play around with the slope of that straight line. So let's do that. We probably would end up with something like this. But what is the mathematically precise way to do what we just did? Well, it is forcing the straight line to have a slope which is equal to the derivative of f at zero. In other words, we force the straight line to be the tangent to f at zero. So let's do that and draw the exact tangent to f at zero. This tangent has the general formula f0 plus f dash zero times x which is, in this concrete case, 1 plus x. So we can say that f of x, that means the values of the exponential functions, are approximately equal to the values of the tangent line for values of x near 0. When doing this linear approximation to f, we of course are not restricted to the values 0 on the x-axis. In fact, we can do the same for just any general point A on the x-axis. If we, for instance, choose A to be 1, we simply draw the tangent to f at A. Of course, the formula for the tangent line changes accordingly. So for all x which are near A, not near 0, but near A, f of x is approximately equal to f of A plus f prime of A times x minus A. It is easy to verify that this formula is indeed the formula for the tangent line to f at a. So let us use these insights for the definition of what we mean by linear approximations. The linear approximation to fx about x equals a is fx is approximately equal to fa plus f prime of a times x minus a for values of x close to a. So let's do an example. We want to find the linear approximation to the function f of x, which is the third root of x, about x equals 1. That means for values of x which are close to 1. We solve this example by looking at the general definition and by calculating the components we need. These are f of a and f prime of a, which are, in our case, f of 1 and f prime of 1. Calculating f of 1 is simple because we simply have to plug in the number 1 into the formula of x. So that equals 
the third root of 1, and that is 1. In order to calculate f prime of 1, we first need the derivative of f. Now, as we can write f of x is equal to x to the power of one third, we can apply the power rule and have f dash of x equals one third x to the power of minus two thirds. Now, plugging in x equals one into this derivative gives one third. Now, it only remains to bring together all components and build up the formula, which is f of x is approximately equal to f of a, which is f of 1, and that is 1, plus f prime of a, which is f prime of 1, and this is 1 third, times x minus a, but x minus a is x minus 1 in this case, and that's it. That is the formula for our linear approximation. That means that is the formula for the tangent to f at a equals 1. We can simplify this a little and get 1 third times x plus 2 thirds. So this linear approximation is the best we can do if we want to approximate the function f with a straight line. Obviously, the approximation quality gets better when we use a polynomial of second degree, that means a parabola, instead of a straight line. Let's again start with just drawing any parabola, where it is reasonable to assume that it goes through the point where f intersects with the y-axis and that it has the same slope as f does at the point zero. But these two conditions don't fix the parabola yet, there is still a degree of freedom. We can see this by moving around the parabola while keeping these conditions. So the question is, how can we exploit that extra degree of freedom which the parabola gives us? Well, when optimizing the straight line, we made sure that the first derivative of f and the first derivative of the straight line are identical. Continuing this idea, we now want to choose the parabola in such a way that the first derivatives and the second derivatives of the parabola and the function f are identical. The parabola, which satisfies these conditions, is uniquely specified and looks like this. Now the question is, how can we find the exact formula for this parabola? And because we are not particularly interested in the formula for the parabola at the value 0, we will develop this formula for a general value a along the x-axis. Because the function we are looking for is a polynomial of second degree, we call it p2 of x. So because it's a polynomial of second degree, we would expect the general formula to look like this, ax squared plus bx plus c. However, it turns out that there is a structure that suits better to our needs, especially by highlighting the fact that our considerations are concentrated at the point A. So we rather establish the following structure for P2. A0 plus A1 x minus A plus A2 x minus A squared. It is important that you note that this is also a general way to write down a second order polynomial. In fact, if the two minus a's weren't there, everything would just be like we know it. Now, including these minus a's means that we shift the curve, which is described by the formula without the minus a's, horizontally along the x-axis by a. Now, using that general approach, we now want to find values for the coefficients a0, a1 and a2. We do this by using the basic conditions we want the parabola to satisfy. And that is first, we want the parabola at a to be equal to the function. And second, we want the first derivative of p2 at a to be equal to the first derivative of f at a. And finally, we want that the second derivative of p2 at a equals the second derivative of f at a. These three conditions guarantee that we have the best fitting of the parabola and the function f around the point a. Let's call them fitting conditions. The fitting conditions force the parabola and its derivatives to behave in a way which is prescribed by the function f and its derivatives at a. 
Let's see how we can use them to find values for A0, A1 and A2. We start with the first one. The condition actually says that we plug in the number A into P2 that that should be F of A. So let's plug in the number A into P2. But if we do that, the two bracket expressions turn into A minus A, which is zero. Which is why all that remains for P2 of A is A zero. We therefore have P2 of A equals A zero. And that should be F of A, according to our condition. So we have already found our first coefficient, and that is a0 equals f of a. Now the next fitting condition is that the first derivatives must coincide at a. We first formally calculate that first derivative of p2, which is p2 prime of x, not of a, but of x, equals a1 plus 2a2 x minus a. That is the general first derivative of p2 where also the coefficients a0, a1 and a2 have been kept general. Now if we plug in a into that derivative, we get p2 prime of a, and now similarly as before, this bracket turns into zero. So all that remains is a1, and we have found our next coefficient, a1 equals f prime of a, which directly comes from our second fitting condition. Now let's have a look at the third fitting condition. First we calculate the general second derivative of p2, p2 prime prime of x. Now that is simply 2a2, which we get if we formally differentiate the first derivative of p2. Now obviously that is a constant function, so it doesn't depend on x anymore, and we have p2 prime prime of a equals 2a2. And we have found our third condition, which is a2 equals f prime prime of a divided by 2. That is our third and last coefficient, and its value is a direct consequence of the third fitting condition. So now we have all components together to build up the concrete formula for p2, which is p2 of x equals f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a plus f prime prime of a divided by 2 times x minus a to the power of 2. That is the best polynomial of second degree by which we can approximate the function f around the value a. So we are ready to write down our next definition. The quadratic approximation to f of x about x equals a is f of x is approximately equal to f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a plus one half f prime prime of a times x minus a squared for values of x close to a. So we now modify our earlier example and try to find the quadratic approximation. Find the quadratic approximation to the function f of x, which is the third root of x, near x equals one. Again, we have to calculate f of one and f prime of one. And additionally, in this example, we also have to calculate f prime prime of 1. That's all we need to do, and the results are plugged in into the formula. So from our earlier example, we already know that f of 1 is 1, and that f prime of 1 is 1 third. The function of the first derivative was f of x equals 1 third x to the power of minus 2 thirds. That is also the result of the earlier example. In this case now, we have to additionally calculate the second derivative. First, generally at x, later we plug in 1. So applying the power rule once more, we get 1 third times minus 2 over 3 x to the power of 5 over 3. And if we simplify, that gives minus 2 over 9 x to the power of 5 over 3. That is the second derivative of f. And if we plug in 1 for x, we get minus 2 over 9. So if we plug these three values into the equation above, and if we use that a is 1, we get this formula for the quadratic approximation, which is f of x is approximately equal to 1 plus 1 third times x minus 1 
minus 1 over 9 times x minus 1 squared, near x equals 1. If we visualize this for this example, that means for the function x equals x to the power of 1 third at the point a equals 1, we get this formula for the quadratic approximation to f near x equals 1. This last expression is exactly equal to what we have found in our calculations. Now the parabola with this formula looks like this. Now it's interesting to let a take other values than 1 and watch what happens to the parabola and its formula. Now let us return to our original example with the exponential function. At a equals 0 we have found the linear approximation and we have found the quadratic approximation. Now of course it suggests itself that we improve these approximations more and more by taking polynomials of higher and higher degree, where we make sure that a polynomial of degree n fits as smoothly as possible to the function f by setting equal the first n derivatives of the polynomial and the first n derivatives of the function f at the point a. Playing this through, this gives us the sequence of polynomials of higher and higher order, which I have shown you in the beginning. And of course, this procedure is not restricted to the point a equals 0. We can do that at any point we want, for instance at a equals 1. Now, having understood the crucial idea of setting equal the first n derivatives, we now want to derive a general formula for the approximating polynomial of degree n for f at a. The principle is very similar to what we did with the quadratic approximation. However, it is more general and a little more complex. We start with a general formula for a polynomial of degree n. Remember our general formula for a polynomial of degree 2, which was p2 of x equals a0 plus a1 x minus a plus a2 x minus a squared. We can this also write as a0 x minus a to the power of 0, because that is actually nothing else than 1, plus a1 x minus a to the power of 1, plus a2 x minus a to the power of 2. And now you see the principle and we can apply the summation notation, which is sum over ai times x minus a to the power of i, where i runs from 0 to 2. And we simply use this structure to generalize the expression to polynomials of degree n by simply replacing the number 2 by n. Now the general formula for a polynomial of degree n is pn of x equals sum over ai x minus a to the power of i and i runs from 0 to n. That is a general polynomial of degree n. Now our major requirement enters the picture. That is, we demand that the first n derivatives of pn equal the first n derivatives of f at the point a. So we demand p, and now the k in brackets means derivative of order k, at a equals f derivative of order k at a, and this should be valid for all k starting at 0, 1, dot, 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 up to n. It's important to realize that the derivative of order 0 is nothing else than the functions themselves. So the requirement with k equals 0 is simply that the two functions should be equal at a. Now I want to calculate the kth derivative of pn evaluated at a. It's not an easy job to do that simply and transparently. I first define some helper functions, which I want to call qi, qi of x, and they are defined as ai times x minus a to the power of i. You see that these helper functions are simply the summons of pn of x. Now I want to calculate the kth derivatives of these helper functions. 
So we have qi derivative of order k of x. Now here we have to distinguish between three cases. Case one is that k is greater than i. So the order of the derivative I want to calculate is strictly greater than i. Now it's important to see that qi is a polynomial with degree i. If I take a polynomial of degree i and I want to differentiate it more than i times, I will always obtain zero. It's like taking a polynomial of degree 3 and differentiating it more than three times. We will always get zero. So the result in case 1 is very simple. It is zero. Now before looking at the second case, I want us to look at the third case. In the third case, we have k is strictly smaller than i. Now we need to ask ourselves, what happens if I differentiate a polynomial of degree i k times where k is less than i? That is just like differentiating a polynomial of degree 3 two times or once. The answer I'm aiming for is, there will always be some x left in the expression. In our case, in this special structure, there will always be some x minus a left in the expression. That is actually the only thing I am interested in. Of course, there is a repeated application of the power rule for differentiation involved, which we could think about in more detail, but all I'm interested in is that I get a long product where one factor at least is x minus a. That's all I'm interested in. Why? Well, because we want to calculate the kth derivative of pn at a, and that means I'm actually also only interested in the kth derivative of qi at the point a. So if we plug in a for x, we also plug in a for x in our third case, and the bracket expression turns into a minus a, which is zero. And that finally turns the complete case number three into zero. Now there's one case left, and that is the case k equals i. In this case, we do have to think about a repeated application of the power rule, and we get as a result k times k minus 1 times dot 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 times 1 times a k. This is in a general way just what happens if we take a polynomial, for instance, of degree 3, and differentiate it exactly three times. Now if I want to calculate the kth derivative of pn at a, we have to build the sum over all kth derivatives of qi at a. And the sum is taken from 0 to n. Now looking at our consideration above, we find that only the sum with index k contributes a value which is not 0. So that means we get q k of k of a. All other summons are a zero. And we have already found above that that equals k times k minus 1 times dot 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 times 1 times a k, which is, in a quicker way to write it, equal to k factorial a k. Now I have to admit, walking through this process has been a little abstract and very general. However, the result is extremely powerful, because if we now pull all components in the blue boxes together and delete all calculations we needed along the way, we have found that k faculty times a k is equal to the derivative of order k of f evaluated at a. And if we divide this equation by k factorial, we obtain a k equals f k a divided by k factorial. So let me guess. I have lost you and you have no idea what we have found now. But in fact, it is very simple to explain where we stand. We started by writing down a general formula for all polynomials of degree n. Then we formulated some demands by which we wanted to select a very special one. These demands address a very special behavior of the polynomial at the point A. First, it needs to have the same function value as f at this point A. And second, 
we want all derivatives up to order n to be equal to the respective derivatives of f. These are the demands. Then we did some calculations and we ended up with formulas for the coefficients in our general polynomial formula. In other words, we have successfully selected our very special polynomial among all the general polynomials of degree n and we are even able to write down a formula for it, which is the following. That is the formula for the nth Taylor polynomial. Although it looks rather complicated, we have always to bear in mind that the expressions for the coefficients are specific numbers which we can calculate, because we know what f is and we know what a and k is. So the formula enables us to write down the Taylor polynomial of any degree at any point a for any function f. So I have to admit that was definitely the hardest part of the video. In the remainder of the video, I want to take the Taylor formula and show you how we apply it for some selected functions. Let's start with the exponential function, because this is what we started our video with. Let's say we want to calculate the Taylor polynomial of degree n for the exponential function at a equals 0. First we observe that we have the special situation for the exponential function that the derivatives of all orders are very simple, namely the exponential function itself. That means that fk of x equals e to the power of x for all k. So now we need to take the value a equals 0 and plug it into the kth derivative of f. That means f kth derivative of 0 is, well, and the kth derivative is e to the power of x, so we have e to the power of 0, and that is 1 for all k. So very simple in this case. So what remains is pn of x equals sum over k from 0 to n. And now fk of a is only 1. So 1 over k factorial times x minus a, but a is 0, so x minus 0 to the power of k. We can write that as sum over k from 0 to n x to the power of k k factorial. So that is the Taylor polynomial of nth degree for the exponential function at a equals 0. So if we write that down in the long way, we have pn of x and now we run through the summation index starting at k equals 0. So we have x to the power of 0, 0 factorial, plus x to the power of 1, 1 factorial, plus x to the power of 2, 2 factorial. And the first members of the sequence, that is 1 and that is x. It's very complicated ways to write down 1 and x. So we have 1 plus x plus 1 half x squared plus 1 over 3 factorial x to the power of 3 plus 1 over 4 factorial x to the power of 4 and so on. So wouldn't it be interesting to have a graphical visualization of the sequence of functions which are represented by this expression? Yes, that would be nice indeed. In fact, we already looked at it. So that's it on the topic of Taylor approximation in this video. Thanks for watching and see you next time.